Hello, everyone, and welcome to the OASIS Responsible Data Summit. My name is Neil Deswani, and I'm calling in for my own personal virtual OASIS here, if you can see the palm tree as, and the waves in the background. I'm going to be talking about moving towards a responsible data economy to prevent big breaches. I'm going to cover this topic in a few different parts. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about some statistics on the number of breaches and the number of records that have been getting breached. I'll then talk about some mega breaches. I'll talk about the root causes behind those mega breaches. And I will then talk about how a platform for a responsible data economy can help prevent big breaches and not big breaches as well. So without further ado, let's get underway. So this graph here shows just the number of reported breaches that have been taking place over the years. This data comes from privacyrights.org, and every time that a organization gets breached and by law has to report it to state attorney generals and such things, uh, that data is reflected here. Now, of course, there may be many unreported breaches that take place, but we're going to go ahead and focus on the reported ones here. So what this graph shows is that from 2005 to 2009, there were approximately a few hundred data breaches taking place per year. And in 2009 and afterwards, there seemed to be a significant step up. Actually, from 2010 and afterwards, there seemed to be a significant step up in the number of breaches that took place. So why did that happen? Well, in 2009, there was an attack called Aurora in which Chinese hacking groups, suspected Chinese hacking groups, basically broke into Google as well as three dozen other companies. And after that attack, it suspected that there was a significant increase in the number of attacks that were getting conducted by nation states and groups that they, that they funded. So from 2010 and afterwards, we see that there's on average about 750 breaches that take place per year. So if you ever see any data from a marketing group that says, oh, the number of breaches has been increasing exponentially. Well, that's not necessarily true. The number of reported breaches has increased from 2010 and afterwards, but not exponentially. One next question that you might ask is, well, how much data is getting stolen in each of these breaches? When I go to the next slide, what you'll see here is that there has been a super linear increase in the number of records that are getting stolen. And one of the biggest breaches that has taken place over the years has been the breach of Yahoo in which all 3 billion of their users' email accounts were exposed. And even incorporating that breach from the announcement of it in 2016, the breach actually took place earlier, uh, the, the, the curve both with that data point and without both is super linear. Not exponential, but super linear. It's, it's, it's not the case that every curve that goes up into the right and happens to be convex is, a, um, is an exponential curve. So uh, definitely super linear. Uh, what this means is that while the average number of breaches has been staying kind of about the same, the attackers are able to get more and more data out of each of the breaches that they uh, conduct. So. Since 2013, there has been a significant number of mega breaches that have taken place. If we go back to the target breach in 2013, in which over 40 million credit card numbers were stolen, uh, we see that year after year, there's kind of been at least one, you know, mega, mega breach. And um, I'll talk about three um, security incidents in this talk. I'll talk about two breaches. I'll talk about the Anthem breach, and I'll talk about the Capital One breach. And then I'll also talk about uh, some abuses, some significant sized abuses that have been taking place, that took place against uh, Facebook. And then once I cover these, we can kind of pop back up and look at some of the root causes that these breaches are taking place. Um, so if I go back to 2015, Anthem, one of the largest uh, healthcare insurance institutions, uh, got breached. The way that this breach occurred is that there was a database administrator that received a phishing email that had a link 
to wellpoint.com, uh, which is a company that Anthem owned, except for the fact that the domain wasn't uh, wellpoint, W-E-L-L point.com. Rather, it was we one one point.com. That domain happened to be a phishing domain owned by the attackers, and the uh, database administrator clicked on the link and entered his production database credentials into, into that site. Uh, how did this breach get detected? Well, the uh, security team at Anthem happened to notice that there was a query running on one of their databases in which all 80 million customer records in the database was being queried, and it happened to be attributed to a particular database administrator. So they asked the database administrator, hey, is this your query that's been running for so long that seems to be uh, retrieving all the customer records? The database administrator said, no, that's not my query. So it was pretty clear that a, a breach had occurred. So that is the Anthem breach. Let's go ahead and talk about the next incident. This next incident happened against Facebook and was an abuse of Facebook. Uh, it started when a researcher by the name of Alexander Kogan, uh, who I believe was a researcher at the University of Cambridge, made about 270,000 users to install a app called This Is Your Digital Life. It was a psychological survey app and would after people fill out a survey, it would tell them a little bit about something about the personality. But one of the things that the app did was gather information, not only about the profiles, the Facebook profiles of the 207,000 users that installed it, but Facebook's API allowed the app developer to not just access information about the people that directly install the app, but access information about all their friends. And so this particular app was able to access uh, profile and other information about 87 million users. And Cambridge Analytica bought this app from Alexander Kogan and used the app to target ads to about 10 million Americans in swing states in the 2016 presidential election. And so this abuse occurred because of the fact that while Facebook did have a set of terms of service which told developers that they're not supposed to store all this data and they're not supposed to access uh, all this data about friends and store that as well, uh, the usage of those APIs was perhaps not as closely monitored as they, as they could have been. And as a result, Facebook services were, were able to be abused by Cambridge Analytica in this way. And by the way, Cambridge Analytica, as a company, they were in the business of helping political candidates win elections. That said, this was probably the most egregious abuse of the Facebook platform. The next incident that I'll talk about is a, is a breach that occurred at Capital One. And in this particular breach, a single lone hacker, an ex-Amazon employee, was able to steal credit card applications for about 100 million US-based users and got their social security numbers, as well as got about 1 million equivalent of social security numbers for Canadian consumers as well. Uh, it was a very significant breach that occurred due to the fact that Capital One had a firewall misconfiguration that allowed the attacker to access about 700 simple storage service buckets on the Amazon Web Services platform. Uh, there was a particular uh, EC2 or Elastic Compute Cloud instance that had a server-side request forgery vulnerability, the attacker was able to leverage that vulnerability to get Amazon's metadata service to give back security credentials for accessing data in all these buckets that they shouldn't have been able to access. So it was a very significant 
breach. And while the attacker was quickly found because of the fact that uh, she happened to store all of the, the data in a repository that also contained her resume, uh, she got five years in jail and a $250,000 fine, but Capital One had estimated breach costs well over a hundred million dollars due to this due to this breach, very significant. So, this is uh, one of the more recent breaches that I'll talk about. Let's talk about why all of these breaches have occurred. There is some data here from also privacyrights.org in which they've categorized what the cause of the breach was according to, to their categorization scheme. And you could see that there, there's a number of different reasons they, they grouped hacking or malware together. Um, there's uh, some uh, causes uh, like insider attack and payment card fraud that are perhaps not as uh, significant as hacking or malware or the fact that unencrypted data was stored on uh, portable devices or that unencrypted data was just physically lost on uh, machines or servers or paper. Uh, so if we were to take a step back and summarize what are the root causes of these breach of these breaches, hacks, and abuses, there's really five or six key root causes. One of them is simply unencrypted data. If data is exposed or a drive or a machine is stolen and the data is not encrypted, that's a reportable breach. Um, another root cause is due to uh, phishing. Another one is due to malware. And over here, I list a number of different uh, breaches in which uh, you know, these tools were used. In Target's case, there was both um, phishing emails and malware used after one of their third parties were targeted. Uh, in Target's case, there was malware used after one of their third parties was targeted. And third party compromise or abuse is also just a, a very significant root cause in and of itself, as I mentioned for the Target and JP Morgan case. But effectively, the abuse at Facebook that took place was due to a third party developer. Cambridge Analytica was one of, a, one of the third party developers. Um, software security vulnerabilities, both first party and third party software security vulnerabilities are an issue. In the case of the 2017 breach against Equifax, there was a, a third party software vulnerability against an Apache strut server that was used to initially compromise Equifax. In other uh, breaches, for instance, Facebook had a breach in which about 50 million plus user profiles got stolen because of the fact that they had you know, three software vulnerabilities uh, associated with their you know, view page as functionality in which it allows you to see what your profile looks like to other people and to the public. But due to uh, an issue with uh, that feature and a video encoder that was used and access that was possible due to due to uh, some of these vulnerabilities uh, you know it, it's a suspected nation state was able to to get at 50 million records and profiles a final root cause is due to just inadvertent employee errors and accidents separate from phishing uh, as well as uh, insider attacks in which the employee is has an intent to actually do something bad as opposed to just making a mistake. So given those root causes, one of the things that Oasis Labs has done is put together one of the first implementations of a platform to enable a responsible data economy. And there's some candidate components of such a platform that they, that they have built. And I'll talk about a, a few of them. Uh, the first is uh, secure computing, which 
keeps data confidential, even when in use by an application. Uh, differential privacy, which ensures that even when people are allowed to do queries, that the queries won't leak information about, say, a particular individual uh, or a cohort of individuals that would not preserve their privacy. There's two other components here. One is a distributed ledger that takes advantage of a blockchain to provide uh, auditing and an immutable log that can't be changed afterwards. And then finally, they have also implemented a federated learning platform where one can uh, do machine learning, but do it in a way that you don't have to centralize all the data that the AI algorithm needs to learn from, you know, on one machine. So I'll talk a little bit about how the platform addresses root causes of breach. So the first uh, root cause is unencrypted data. So if unencrypted data is a root cause, well, the way you solve it is you encrypt the data. And so one of the platform defenses here is a uh, secure computing platform in which there's a secure enclave. Uh, so the idea behind a secure enclave is that you have uh, a dedicated processor and some dedicated memory and just dedicated hardware that is used to process sensitive information so that even if an administrator's credential gets compromised, that the attacker still won't be able to get at the sensitive information that is being processed in the enclave. And in that enclave, uh, data, sensitive data is always encrypted as rest and always encrypted in motion. And that can use, be used to address the issue of unencrypted data. The next area is that of uh, phishing and malware. And one of the challenges with phishing is the phishers are always working to steal account credentials. And if there's too many individuals that have raw data access and are able to do a query for say all the records in the database, it can make phishing attacks particularly dangerous. So one thing that you can do is very significantly restrict um, how much raw data access can take place by certain individuals. On the malware side of things, uh, a lot of times if malware is able to get on a machine and install itself at say the kernel level, uh, pretty much all, all bets are off. And so what, um, what one of the things that a secure computing platform, a secure enclave does, is it has what's called trusted uh, execution environment technology so that code that's running that is processing sensitive data is actually protected from even, it, like if it's running in a virtual machine, it's protected from the hypervisor, even if the hypervisor gets taken over by an attacker. And of course, there is hardware support that's required to provide those level of guarantees. But that's how such a, such a platform for a responsible data economy can address phishing and malware. The third area that I'll talk about on this slide is inadvertent employee mistakes, insider attacks, and in addition to some of the things that I've already talked about, uh, such a platform can have differential privacy constraints. So what that means is that when a particular query runs, even if the person is allowed to run the query, um, the 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 middleware here will basically decide not to return results if they're not privacy preserving. So for instance, let's take an example in which, let's say an insider wanted to try to figure out what a new employee's salary is. Well, in a typical scenario, if the insider can run a query on the average salary of employees before the new employee joins, 
and then run the same query after the employee joins, then even though the insider is only able to look at averages, uh, they are able to derive what is the salary of the new employee. And so differential privacy constraints would prevent those types of accesses and prevent results from getting returned should the results you know be 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 focused on invading privacy as per as per a set of constraints uh, that are put in place so the the next two root clauses that I'll talk about are third party compromise or abuse and software security vulnerabilities in the case of third party abuse as occurred in the Facebook case, uh, one thing that such a platform can do is allow a separate company, a separate organization, to be a custodian of all sensitive data and basically allow third parties to access that data and run algorithms in such a way that the custodian ensures that for instance, differential privacy constraints are in place. And I'll provide an example of that. Finally, in the case of software security vulnerabilities, when such a platform is constructed by a company or an organization that's full of security experts and has hardened their platform and has reduced as many attack surfaces as possible, uh, that platform is just going to be less likely to be attacked due to software security vulnerabilities. Not impossible, nothing in security is ever 100%, but chances are that are gonna be able to do a much better job at it than uh, if, say, you know, software engineers with no security training uh, are tasked with building such a platform and such a set of defenses. How would some of these platform defenses have prevented some of the breaches that we've talked about. Well, in the case of Anthem and Capital One, it pretty much came down to one user who was able to access pretty much all the records. And so in a secure enclave where you have mediated access and you have uh, differential privacy running, uh, you know, such technology would simply not allow all those queries to, to execute and return pretty much all the data. In the case of Facebook, if one took all of the profile data, gave it to a third party, and allowed access with differential privacy and other constraints running on it, plus also kept a very uh, detailed audit trail of what queries were run, by whom, when, and used a blockchain to keep track of all of that, then in the case that there was any questionable access, uh, it wouldn't take you know months to figure out what happened, uh, but rather one would be able to figure out, well, who was the, who was the third party, say, developer that abused their access um, in, a, in a much more efficient way. So to give an example of how Oasis Labs and their platform has been designed to do this for an application in the pharmaceutical space, uh, the idea here is that you have a pharmaceutical company that has a whole bunch of data on clinical trials. And instead of keeping all that data themselves, what they do is they upload all that data into the OASIS platform. And when they have third parties, third party analysis firm, for instance, that want to write algorithms and run algorithms that try to make predictions on the trials data, then what happens is Oasis will go ahead and uh, run those algorithms in a very careful way. It'll check 
uh, a whole bunch of privacy policies that are set up ahead of time. It will decrypt data in a clean room environment. It will run the analysis programs. Um, it will generate uh, an audit log of uh, what was accessed, when, and whatnot. And what the OASIS platform can do is provide the results of the analysis to the pharmaceutical company um, without having the pharmaceutical company need raw access to all of the data that went into doing the analysis. So that's one example of how a platform for a responsible data economy and how, for instance, the Oasis platform can be used to be a custodian of the sensitive data and allow the pharmaceutical company to get what it really wants and what it really needs that's core to its business and its business model. Implementing security and privacy is a complicated thing to do and it takes a lot of expertise. And so the idea here is to let, for instance, the Oasis platform uh, handle all of that and get the pharmaceutical company the analysis results that it needs to do its business. So to summarize, a platform for a responsible data economy is a very interesting concept that can be used to help move the field forward. Uh, Oasis Labs has implemented uh, such um, components and in this talk, what we've shown is how those components can come together as a platform to help prevent the root causes of breaches. And certainly, if some of the companies here were, were using a responsible data economy and a platform for a responsible data economy, had, had that existed at the time and been in use, then one can make the argument that some of those mega breaches just would have never been able to take place. So with that, I hope that you've learned how a platform for responsible data economy can be used to prevent breaches going forward.